All right, let's let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good afternoon, Roby. My name is Claudia, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C. Uh, for the students of Fairfax City, we're very grateful that Roby Perry accepted our invitation to our show. Roby, welcome to the show, man. Thank you very much, Claudia. I'm very happy to be here. Same, same here, man. Um, Roby, let, let's go back to the beginning in your, in your life. Were you born like in a musical family? I mean, how old were you when you perhaps began taking guitar lessons or piano lessons? Uh, good, 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 good question. Very good question. Um, musical family, yeah. Well, my mother comes from the musical family, really. Um, and it was her, grand her father, my grandfather, of course, played fiddle and he taught his children. Um, and he was quite spectacular. I've heard such wonderful stories. Um, I live in the house, actually. I live in the house that my mother was born in and uh, her father was born in. So I'm very privileged to have that opportunity. So locally, I'm always picking up stories that people make about my grandfather and what he used to do uh, musically. And that by all accounts, he was quite a genius, really, you know. Um, wow. So that's really where those side of things come from um and growing up actually in the house in london um there was always music being played lots of records always being played so we always had i think that in the background um and that was always fun and exciting and i think to be honest like for a lot of people uh for a lot of people to have something of a, a musical background whether you play uh, an instrument or not mm. it's just important to actually have a lot of music around um, even if you know radio the, you just got to be immersed in it because it just shows the love that people have for it and the importance of it in your in your life and so we had plenty of that anyway and uh growing up we just all experimented with instruments none of us really took any formal training at all um I can't remember properly uh, <laughs> having any formal training. Um, the only, actually, the only formal training I would have had was when I was in school at about 13 years of age and I had some drum lessons. I think I had some saxophone lessons and a little bit of piano as well. But by that stage, I'd already been messing on these things as you acquire them, as you're growing up, really, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that in itself gives you I suppose um, another angle, another creative angle. When you, you know, there's there's pluses and minuses to 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 having a, I think having a, a formal education, um, discipline, etc., and all that stuff can be really good. But at the same time, uh, you kind of need to go where the sounds in your head are talking to you from, really. You know. And if you're doing grades and all that sort of thing, then it's hard, I think, for some people to do that at an early age. Now, I'm not going against formal musical education whatsoever at all by saying that, but I'm just stating really that I really enjoyed the way I was introduced to music, um, which is really just finding it, finding it yourself. Mm. Um, so from all of that, I think I had something pretty good and I've always, it's always been a really good friend. Um, and I could never really see myself doing anything else other than anything associated with music, really. Um, and then I found my way at some point, this won't be chronological, I'm rambling here, but sure. I found my way through the enjoyment of playing music to teaching music. And I wouldn't teach that even in a formal way either. Um, and I used to teach children, whether it was drums or guitar, things like that. But probably a lot of the important work I did was really going into schools and working with special needs students. And that's where the whole PhD thing came from, because I would build a lot of instruments and I'd build a lot of stuff out of recycled materials, things that were to hand, really. Um, and I would look at stuff really, um, as a piece of sculpture as well. So it wasn't just the physics of what would produce a certain type of sound and therefore make it, 
but you would look at an object and you'd say that's absolutely beautiful in its own right. The wheel of a car, the wheel of a bicycle, whatever it may be, uh, a spade for the garden. And, uh, and then you would think how you could transform that. And those kind of objects, they always give themselves physically to some sort of sonics. So it was easy enough to string them and turn them into electrified instruments. And so I kind of brought those challenges into schools. And the idea was really to break down those kind of barriers of formal training and to show people that um, exploration. So you're self-learning, really. Um, there aren't really any rules to break at all. There are no rules. You just introduce yourself to something and take it from there, really, you know. So that was kind of important for me. And then I have a love of electronics as well. Uh, from when I was an early teenager. And the opportunity to do a PhD then uh, was pretty exciting. So I mixed it with music and autism. So my idea then through electronics really was to create instruments with sensors so that you could remove the physical barrier for people with uh, alternative needs, physical disability, etc. you know? Yeah. Um, and that meant then that people could not just play by themselves, but they could play as a group and therefore access music. So all of it really at the end of the day was to access music and make it easier for everybody, you know, to play. So that was, that was a life changing thing for me as well. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, that led to workshops with groups, et cetera, et cetera. But music education, now it's storytelling. The funny thing, I work in schools and um, I mix all, all the formats and media together then through storytelling, um, getting children to kind of compose their own characters, invent their own plot lines together as a, as a group. And then that's all put together uh, with special effects and scripted. And then it's like a radio play. And then I usually put that together on an mp3 player that i build and that's then incorporated into the artwork they produce for the story so that's another thing i like to do because nothing's really isolated nothing really exists in isolation in the arts everything seems to overlap with another thing certainly our appreciation for things do anyway yeah absolutely so yeah so, yeah, so that's uh that's that little string of wandering in my storytelling you can stop me yeah. and prompt me for something else no no that's good it's good that you you have the love of music and the love of teaching and able, you're able to convey that with mm. kids with special needs i i mean in my family uh i think most of us are you know i i, I know i have you know a little bit of hdhd autism yeah. asperger and i never take took any medicine but uh, music became very important in my life and has given yeah. me, without being a musician, so much satisfaction. It's a beautiful thing to, to you know, you don't need to be a musician. You buy a record, go to shows or listen to you do whatever, and, and mm. being, try to bring music into your life, you know, uh, whether you're yeah. a doctor, engineer, uh, a cab driver, or, you know, or yeah. any, any profession in between, you know, it's, it's a beautiful yeah. thing. Right? It is, it is indeed. Um, yeah, and so, you know, it's, it's not something to be necessarily put on or taken off, turned up or turned down, but it's, it's, a uh, it's that thing of expression, um, that's hard to do through other mediums sometimes, you know, so, yes. and, and that's the thing is making it accessible for people, breaking down the mystery, but without mm. destroying the magic. You know, and, and I remember um, a teacher telling me that uh, uh, through a workshop training, actually, a long, long time ago. It was just one of those things that never, never leaves you, really, you know, to break down the mystery because you're teaching, you're learning. Mm -hmm. But the magic still stays because it's the magic that keeps us coming back all the time, you know. So Absolutely, yeah. And I think that goes for anything in life, really, you know. So... But yeah, it's all good. It's all a it's all a fantastic journey. 
it's all Absolutely. A, a wonderful song. I think that yeah. we're all uh, intertwined with, you know, we all yeah. have our parts to play in it. So, Absolutely, yeah. Man. Were, were you in any band in sort of high school? You were listening to music, I don't know, at the time, maybe, I yeah. don't know, people like the Led Zeppelin, the Pink Floyd, the, you know, oh, the yeah. Genesis of this world. And so the world. Cover bands. Yeah, oh, I'm yeah. 18 years in Ireland, I was in cover bands, yeah. yeah. Um, and they were just, you know, cover bands for what was in the charts, really, you know. And so that's, yeah. that's good fun. You've got to have something like that. Never in a band that played solely the music of another band, though. But just in in general, and um, it's also part of the economy as well, and the pub economy to to um, as a, or a working musician to actually, you know, make extra money by by playing the weekends to uh, sure. people enjoying their merriment and mm. entertain them, you know, as well. Um, mm. But that's funny too. Yeah, that's a whole. That can be a bit of a. That can be a bit of, you know, so many things. A variety is good. Um, but the danger is concentrating in one thing and one thing only. And then you fall, you kind of fall to the problems that might exist, you know? Um, yeah. so I kind of tend to avoid, I, 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 you know, I, I just can't sit still anyway on a lot of stuff. And <laughs> if I'm bored, my mind wanders. I'm sure you can, uh, uh, um, relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, so I mean, I'm the same, you yeah. know? You need variety. You need to keep things kind of moving, really, you know. So, but yeah, mm -hmm. I did those things. I, the first thing I ever did, which was quite funny, was when I was about probably eleven or twelve in school in New Zealand, and um, um, and it was a cover of a song, a Kiss song, yeah. and it was just one of those things that was like a school talent contest. So that's the first time I ever played drums which were the rubbish bins or the waste bins you know for the school <laughs> but we were all painted up like all the characters out of kiss you know and uh <laughs> and that was just so funny miming to a record um yeah yeah that was probably my first kind of inner band kind of moment and then after that it was always just instruments by myself that i'd pick up along the way and do things until in my teen years or at school We used to do a lot of jamming, but uh, but yeah, a couple of bands in the teenage years, and then I suppose I really kind of started with Deck and Dance. First, first time I played with Deck and Dance, I was still in school. I was 14 years of age, or late 13, um, and uh, I came to play tambourine. I think it was at the Brixton Academy or something like that. In, in London. Um, so I had to leave school early for that. And uh, that was good crack. That was good crack. And then yeah. after that, I started playing with them. Um, it was the early 80s anyway. No. But uh, there, 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 you say the first gig would have been in the early 80s? Or be, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, what's the early 80s? Well, I would have been almost 14 years of age. 15 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, I just can't quite remember. That must have been 82 or three, or something like yeah. that. And yeah. then I started touring around with them in about 87. And that was okay. Euro typical European tours on buses yeah. and uh, that kind of crack. But it was always good. It was always good. I always enjoyed um, finishing school, jump on the bus, drive around to the Isle of Dogs, where they would yeah. be rehearsing. And That's right. Just soak it all up. Just constantly soak it all up. Yeah. Um, I loved it. Loved every bit I, of it. Yeah. I think you must be familiar with the book that Peter Ulrich had that brand. I haven't. I, it, it's oh, I need to, talk, I need I to talk to Peter to send you a copy. I interviewed him three times. He, he told ah. all the stories, man. <laughs> ah, yeah. Pete, uh, I haven't read the book. I haven't read the book. It's a disgrace, but uh, I should get around <laughs> to it. Um, he was brilliant. Pete was fantastic. Yeah. He's just solid, an absolutely solid guy. Mm. And while everybody else was getting dramatic and exploding, he always kept his cool and That's kept right. everything together. Yeah. You yeah, know, Pete, lot... Peter, he's a very, Peter's a very nice, very good human being. He's the type of guy that may be an earthquake, a fire, and the guy will keep yeah. it cool. You know, I, 
Some yeah. people manage it. People will be arguing and screaming on the buses late or the yeah. crowd, whatever. Yeah. And then, and then, <laughs> then Peter oh, will totally. be there. <laughs> totally. Totally. But he, was, think, he was also, he, oh, I think he also, his, he started a family earlier than anybody. As That's well. right. Yeah. So that okay. kind of, I suppose that adds to your responsibilities and your, your mm -hmm. context maybe or something. But, um, yeah, no, he's such a lovely guy. Um, mm -hmm. so it's lovely when I get to see him. We always yeah. have a good, a good knowing kind of laugh and smile with each other. We don't actually have to say that much. Because really? That's a, that's a, yeah. That's a special mm -hmm. person, you know? Absolutely. Uh, currently you are, you know, you are, uh, the, the well, the musical composer, director of the Town Hall Cavani at, at the yeah, that, also that's theater a, company. Feel free to that's elaborate. A, <laughs> that's an that's an old CV. That's the CV yeah. that I'd send around for doing applications for arts grants uh, or or things like that. But um, yeah, that that was prior to 2017, actually. Yeah. Um, so that kind of started, I suppose, just working with everybody in Cavan, really. Um, a lot of really good, interesting, talented people. And I think the town hall was such an interesting old building. It was starting to fall into disrepair. And so the council allo uh, allowed uh, a group, um, a group of artists really uh, to kind of, you know, take it over, do things in it, put on productions, that kind of thing. And that, that went for a, a good number of years. Um, and that was absolutely fabulous. There was so much talent there. And, um, yeah, so much talent there. Um, and so I ended up basically collaborating. We all collaborated. And uh, collaborating with ideas and kind of taking charge with the musical direction of things as well. So with Philip Doherty who was writing a lot of the plays, um, we would collaborate on ideas and I would write the scores for whatever productions we were doing, which was pretty fast paced um, because everything was done on a low budget too. And uh, sometimes that's always the best for creativity. And so everything was done on the hoof, very quickly on the fly, improvised. And I would land with all the instruments that I'd have around me, from percussion to strings to wind. And it was as if I had already written, <laughs> written the things before. Really? Because of, wow. what, because of what was expected. And, uh, and it would be a case of like, we're, 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 we're rehearsing this particular part of the script. I need this. Boom. You just pull it out of your head. Because you, wow. and that's probably a lot of that's to do with the experience of, of listening to so many different genres of music. And you need to enjoy them as well, I think, to really do them justice and to pull stuff out quickly and do that. Then the next big problem was remembering what you'd done because it was improvised. So that was suddenly concrete, and you'd have to keep track of everything that was going on for consistency. Um, but so that was, that was just a, uh, that was quite a, a really interesting period of creativity, those years. And that was kind of from, for me, that was 2014 to 2017, really. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, a lot of people now, most of those people have all split and gone to different parts of the country doing different things. A lot of people are still around, but then the council basically got the money to, to do up the town hall. And uh, and then it became another thing. It wasn't so much a community space anymore. It became a, a normal kind of a, a theater and gallery kind of place. And so that magic was kind of squeezed out of it because it's a bit like that Joni Mitchell kind of song about the taxi and the, the parking side of the parking space. People don't realize the magic because when sometimes these things happen, um people take it for granted that's what it's all about but uh a lot of that stuff needs maintenance and encouragement and funding to be honest because everything we did was on a budget but it was high creativity and now it's a kind of a normal space where they put uh 
typical plays on and, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so it doesn't have that ballsy kind of element that it used to have, you know. Um, that's important, I think, for everybody to recognize uh, when something is really, really good happening in the middle of nowhere, wherever it is, it's not something that happens all the time and it has to be, uh, it has to be looked after really and appreciated. But it's like anything for a time, something exists and then it goes somewhere else and you, you look for it, you know, you always travel around and look for it. So that was really, really good. I enjoyed all of that. And out of that, then. Philip uh, had a film, uh, Redemption of a Rogue, that he put together quite quickly. And then, um, so COVID, the beginning of COVID was spent writing the soundtrack for that, which yeah. is, uh, which was, yeah, pretty exciting, pretty exciting stuff, as there wasn't a whole pile going on in COVID. Um, yeah. That's how I started COVID for me, anyway. Good for you, so, man. Good for yeah, you. Yeah. And did this year you I think you end up participating in the Clones Film Festival with uh with regional yeah. special performance yeah. of a live yeah, that was, public screen yeah. for Atu. Wow. Yeah, yeah, with my daughter, Rita, yeah. yes. Um yeah, she's 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 really interesting. Uh she's an amazing singer. She's a beautiful uh guitarist. And um yeah, she and incidentally she's uh, a music therapist now that she studied in, in University of Limerick for two years and did a master's in music therapy. So she's continuing that whole tradition in our family, at least. But yeah. uh, as a musical performer and writer, she's really, really talented. So we had, we had, yeah, we've had that for a while, the Clonus Film Festival. And yeah, Nosferatu was a, a choice um, to do this year. And... It was great, and we just put the music together in a couple of weeks, really, working at that. And, uh, yeah, Clonus is a very small town in Monaghan, and uh, it's just got a really good collective of artists and people that really love film. And uh, we had done something uh, two years before that with another formation, APO 33, and uh, it went down a treat. So it was a no-brainer to do something for it uh, this year. So I think myself and my daughter will continue doing um, a lot of collaborative stuff together, but definitely scores for films, silent films. It's a lot of fun because you can, you can do, you can do anything you want, really. Um, we weren't really looking at traditional scores that may have been done before. It was a lot more electronic in nature. Uh, as well as being percussive as well, you know? Yeah. Is there a recording of that or, or somebody taped that or is in YouTube or? Well, this, is, a, you this, know? this is, I, I have a recording of it somewhere. No, I have a recording of it. Oh, good but, for you. Uh, it's, it's, it's so funny. Um, it's like all the stuff that I did really in the town hall. There's everything's written, everything's performed. Things are recorded as you're rehearsing things, but for whatever reason, when it comes to filming or recording, it doesn't go down that way. It's like you spend your time getting everything to red ready, and then yeah. that one thing for posterity just seems to be elusive. And so a lot of the stuff I've done has been in the moment. Um, yeah. You know, it's just... I can't be doing that. Somebody else has to do that. Of course, you know, <laughs> you need to concentrate in the in the music and playing somebody else doing the recording, obviously, right? Yeah, so. yeah. But then again, for that for that to be released as something, and it's probably worth doing. Um, it means we have to start again and record for the listener, and it doesn't always work that way. It's something that works in the moment for a projection, but when you have to to put something together uh, for somebody who's listening with without the film itself then you you you're losing you're missing the context so and i think so much about music has to have context 
uh, or, or, or certain types of music, you know, because sometimes with things like Nosferatu, there was like a lot of tongue in cheek and yeah. the humor in there that if you're not familiar with the film, you're not necessarily, you're going to say, what the hell are these guys up to? That's kind right. Thing, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but there it, you go. In general, Rui, um, what's the, what's the creative process with you, whether when you were part of, uh, I don't know, Dead Can Dance or the writing film score or working with the other people that you have worked you, how music come to you? I mean, you, it, it, you, you wake up in the morning every day and you are writing stuff down, you go for a walk and ideas come to your head and you record it, you play a little bit on the piano in your, in your cell phone. And how, how the music come to, to you? The, the, uh, yeah. To, you don't, yeah. you don't, you're a creative person, so you don't go to your office and say, no, hey, I want to write the best piece no. of music in the history of the world, right? So, no, 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 I don't, you know. Um, uh, it's a really good question. Um, I don't know. It's like I have in my head, there's something running the whole time, running the whole time, imaginary mm. music, although it's there for me, it's real and it's physical because it's in my imagination. But so I can pick up, I'm not as disciplined as I should be, but I can pick up uh, an instrument or, or, or anything that I could physically get around yeah. and pull something out because it's not about replicating. It's about searching for something and it's about a sound or a tone. And if you can find that, then it's a question of pushing expression. So you need imagination to, you need imagination to create expression. Otherwise you have nothing to say. And so when you start pulling that out, it leads to the next thing. And then you, whether you turn it into a song or compose, that's another thing. But to actually pick up something and just, it's to be, in, I suppose, you, I don't know. Some people might say, you know, you draw your inspiration from a beautiful morning. It's, you might put you in the mood, but I don't, don't think the, the notes are necessarily like floating around the trees. Nec you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's something that puts you in the mood to sit down and do something, but the music is either, it's, it's got to be within you to, to extract. But another way of looking at it as well is that it's like a river above your head that's constantly flowing and you dip into it. At any point you dip into it, it's something, it's something that would have gone past you otherwise. So you dip into it and there it is and you extract from it and you, you know, you create something out of it. But I, I suppose in a way I'm trying to say that there isn't really anything, um, you know, there's nothing really original. I don't think it's a bad thing to say that because a lot of people get, you know, termed with being a genius or this, that, and the other. And I think it's a dangerous thing to say that, uh, because when it's, if you know the process, I think you understand that it's not, it's not that it's, it's not so difficult. It's, it's a question of just going, is that what you naturally do? And you dip into it and you make something of it. But by the, by the statement of it's nothing's original, I just mean there's a constant recycling. There's a constant flow of music in the universe that just keeps going around and around because everything in the universe is constantly contributing all the time. So how could you not find something that has to be there? So, you know, you could take the spiritual side of that, you know, another worldly side of that if you want. Um, for me, it's just a very natural thing. There it is. And bang, you assume the position, you know, you assume the character, you assume the role to sort of extract that thing and express it. And bang, it happens. It just happens, you know. The, I think the danger and difficulty is when you try to make something, you, you try to edit something before it comes out sometimes, or through other people's expectations, they put restrictions on your creativity and you do that yourself. It's not necessarily other people doing that to you, but you'll do that with your own creativity. It's a whole lot easier when you don't have those pressures, you know, so. Sometimes you have the pressure for record labels, right? To, hey, we want a hit, we want 
Your, your band, whatever band happened to be, to sound like this, to sound like that, you know, and in, in the example of Dead Can Dance, you know, Brendan and Lisa's music is very different from anything else, so they couldn't conform to pop or rock or... Yeah. Yeah, so, so I didn't get the beginning of that question. No, I'm, I'm saying that sometimes you get the pressure for record labels, right? Oh, yes. yes. To, to be, well, we would like you to sound like this or to sound like that or, you know... Yeah. Or, or, uh, I, I think, I think um, it was very, very fortunate for them and other people in the same position. Sure, were, were the right person at the right time. Mm -hmm. Because I think Ivor Watts was was pretty cool at that time, and he he went with something he heard and signed them up, et cetera, et cetera, and the rest is history. But he mm -hmm. allowed that to happen. Um, whereas other people hasn't maybe been as fortunate or, you know, I hear, I hear of bands that make the most beautiful music and then you hear, then you hear they didn't like doing that because they were pressured to do that. That's right. That's right. Oh my God, what a shame. So, so the same thing means different things to different people always, you know, but no, mm. I think tech and dance were very lucky to be able to follow their own path. That's uh, and they were. They're creative giants, Brendan and Lisa, in that sense. They, 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 I think they still had, you know, they have other, uh, they had probably other things that helped shape, you know, what they produced as well, not just yeah. the label saying, oh, you got to do this or that. I mean, they had it easy that way, I guess, but, but there are other things that shape your music. I mean, resistance is there to shape things, it's how yeah. you get around it. You can't. Yeah. obliterate it you've got to shape the thing you're doing and so it's quite possible the thing that we appreciate with music is is that shaping process not the core sound mm -hmm. you know it's that shaping process and that shaping comes from resistance and issues and how do you get around this how do you get around that you know they're the solutions we hear the solutions even you mm -hmm. know but then again, there's a whole other side of music which is really free and liberating as well, and that's experimental music. And I have a lot of time for experimental music that doesn't use any formulas, and it's about just it's like it's like some sort of science or something, you know? It's a tone mm. that breaks up and does wondrous things, or, or minimalism at least, you know, yeah. just somewhere in between, and um, and that resonates a lot with me as well. Because I'm fascinated with sound. It's not just music. Mm -hmm. It's actual sound. It's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, good, good for you, man. Now now we're talking a little bit of Dead Can Dance. In 20, I'm picking a different thing for your CV here. Yeah. In 2022, you were part of the Dead Can Dance European tour. Feel free to elaborate what's the process or going from city to city, taking a bus, waking up in the morning. How difficult uh, is it, man? Sometimes you get... You know, a bad night's sleep, and you need to, you know, get coffee in the morning, catch a bath, catch a fly, and then do your best at between 8 and 10 p.m., have a couple of beers, go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, catch the bath in the morning again. It's, oh it's a God. lot of work. It's very difficult. People don't realize that. Well, you know. I, my, my, my hat comes off to the road manager in that situation because they yeah. have to basically round up a bunch of kids. And exactly. In, in that case, they've got you know, include, including the road crew, who are way much more disciplined in general than than the bands usually are. Um, they've got you know twenty people to corral, or in the middle of the night when you're traveling between. Um, I'm trying to think now, Bulgaria and somewhere else. You know, yeah. the next it's three o'clock in the morning. Everybody has to get out and line up in their dressing gowns. And somebody doesn't have their passport, and it's, you know, there's, there's, uh, it's a team effort, and you, you need to know. You need to know what time you're getting off the bus. You need to know what time you're getting on the bus. And, yeah. and I have to say, it's endlessly, it's so much different, so much more different than it was in the early days. Because Peter was the tour manager in the early yeah. days. And so he had a lot of responsibilities. Um, but it's also a lot more complex now traveling in these in these days too so mm. so um yeah you do need your wits about you you've got to work as a team 
you can't be delaying things. But to be honest, look, in the context of the world and, and where we are, I mean, I have no time for anybody that complains about not getting a coffee. Oh, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I mean y- if you get on the bus, you're lucky. Just get on the friggin' bus and get to the <laughs> next next stop. Don't be complaining about anything. Um, yeah. But yeah, life on the road, it's a funny one. Uh, Jules said to me something funny that he had read from one of the Rolling Stones. He, some One of the guys in the Rolling Stones was asked, uh, it could have been Keith Richards, I guess, was asked, what did you think about, um, well, touring life? And I think the response was like, it's, you know, it's, it's two hours playing and then 22 hours sitting around doing nothing kind of thing, you know? So yeah. if you, you know, so when you leave home for a couple of months, you're only doing two hours a night, you know, for two or three, I suppose, most of the week anyway, or half yeah. of the week, I guess. Um, but the, you, it's what you do with the other the rest of the time. And it's a difficult one to be productive in that time. It's hard to take your mind off it. You're kind of in a strange state of, um, I won't say conflict, but there's a low-level tension because of the expectation of what you're doing and where you need to be. And even though there's time to relax and do all those things, it's not really chaotic, but you're there to do a job. So some people do it really well. They arrive to a place and they run off and visit all the sites and do all of that and they make it back in time for a sound check. And da, 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 da. I do find it hard to fucking do a load of stuff. So you do end up spending a lot of time, um, yeah, not sitting around, but because you're laughing and joking, really. And you, you have to have you have to have camaraderie. I mean, that's what a band is. It keeps itself going and ticking when it's not on stage. So you've got to have that. And there was great camaraderie amongst the museums, uh, museums, amongst the musicians. Yeah. And deck and dance, you know. So, but it was exciting. Yeah, it was exciting. I mean, it always is. Uh, bouncing off the back of the previous tour, and then we had like three cancelled tours because of COVID in between 2019 yeah. and 2022. Yeah. So we were also really excited to finally be back and uh, and doing Absolutely. it. But but there is a joy. There's a great joy out of playing. I suppose up in that level of things and that level of concerts, the yeah. kind of upper hall type places and. You can never believe it when you get to one and you see how beautiful it is and it's like blows your mind. And then the next one's even more beautiful and so on and so forth. But one of the things that I really enjoyed was that we did a lot of Eastern European countries. And that's that's a whole other universe in itself. Absolutely, um, yeah, yeah. That was that was quite an eye opener and um yeah, fabulous people. I mean that's the thing. You're meeting fabulous people everywhere. Mm. And uh I think that's important. It's like travel, really. It just uh, reinforces your positive view of the world, you know? Yeah. With no, people. absolutely. When you're a touring musician, for example, you know, playing in, I don't know, uh, cities with high income, like Madrid, Spain, or Paris, or London, yeah. uh, it's very difficult to go to Eastern European country where the income per capita is is much lower and people pay, I don't know, 20, 30 pounds or dollars or... Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because people need to work yeah. like a week to earn 45 pounds, so they really yeah. Enjoy it, you know? Yeah, they do. And yeah, that you start hearing when you hear that stuff. I mean, like the cost of the. I, I, I'm not usually one when I go and see a band to buy paraphernalia, t shirts, and records. Uh, yeah. I'll buy them somewhere. But unless there's somebody that really blows my mind, I've got to have something. It's nice to remember the event. Yeah. But I am surprised at the uh, at the price of merchandise. And, and yes, when you're going into a poorer country, people are struggling to actually to do that. But um, I don't have a whole pile of influence or anything to do with that. It's almost like that whole merchandise is, is yeah. a machine in itself and a whole other business. Somebody yeah. signs somebody up to do something and then that thing happens. Yeah. But it is a thing that everybody's doing, and it's um, it's a big money maker. It's a big money maker for for bands, and that's the yeah. kind of, and that's what it is now. Playing live music really is is the way to uh, is the way to survive. I think. 
it has yeah. a, it has a bizarre kind of consequence that it's actually good in a way that maybe I'm not sure.